Well, if you came this morning uh, expecting to hear Pastor Plank, you're stuck with me. And uh, so I hope you're okay with that. Uh, we're not going to allow for any responses right there. But uh, why don't you stand with me? First Samuel, First Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16. What does God look for when he wants a king? What kind of a man was God trying to find to, to be kingly material? In 1 Samuel 16 and verses 6 and 7 is uh, where we'll be looking at. 1 Samuel 16, and we'll start our reading at verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Dear Heavenly Father, we pause in your presence this morning. Thank you that you've been with us, you've helped us so far, and we just ask would you continue to do so. Help us, Lord, this morning to take a look at our hearts and what exactly you're looking for today, and we'll give you praise in your name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. A pure heart, the heart that God is looking for. You think of the British throne and um, how... You may try to become king or queen. Well, really the only way you could do so is to either be born into the royal family or marry into the family. But even then, there's still a good chance that someone else will get it. A good heart, not a, a physical heart, but the inner man. What describes it? What comes out of your heart? Your conscience, your will, the desires, the affections, the purposes, the imaginations, the loyalty. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. God is saying, son, give me thine heart. We will not be kings really probably ever in our life, but God wants to use us. God's looking at our hearts. He's not looking for good looks. He's not looking for personality. He's not looking for talent or wealth or what school you go to or what degree you have or whatever else you think you might have. Those are not the qualifications that God uses to see if he can use us or not. God is looking for a clean heart. A pure heart, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. In the Beatitudes, we see that verse that says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The presence of any sin in the heart is irreconcilable with the, the measure of holiness in which God desires. You see, inner, inner holiness or, or purity involves uh, a correction of the moral nature by completely cleaning, by completely purging, cleansing the, any remains of sin that may be in our hearts. Adam Clark says that the Pharisees were all about out, outward purity. While their hearts were full of corruption and defilement, a principal part of, of really the, the Jewish religion, when you look at it, was um, it consisted of, of being clean. And it was involving an outward cleansing and making sure um, the things that they were doing were, were clean, were pure. But Christ shows that purification of the heart is way more important than anything else. Yes, being clean is important. I hope you took a shower at least, at least once this week. It would have been good every day, I hope. But at least once. But really, the most important thing that you should worry about in regards to your spiritual condition is, is your heart clean? Do you have a pure heart? Holiness and happiness are fully described and they're put together. For true religion consists of heart purity. True Christianity lies in the heart, in the purity of the heart, in the washing away of, of the wickedness 
of the heart. There's three things this morning that God is specifically looking for and that you can have in relationship to a pure heart. First of all, this morning, the meaning of a pure heart is unmistakable. Our heart must be cleaned. It must be cleansed by confession, by forgiveness, an undivided allegiance to God, a loyalty, a commitment to Him. We can really, we can act the part uh, when it's really important to, but there are many um, other times and many other things that really have our loyalty, that have our commitment. Where is your loyalty this morning? There are poisons that look like crystal spring water. A glass of such poison placed next to a, a glass of clear water, it'll fool the eye. In fact, the two of them look exactly the same. But one has death in it, and the other has life in it. You have to discover by other means than drinking the true nature of the liquid to see which one is which. In the same way, there are many things in life that are deadly. They have the appearance of goodness, but they're deadly. This is why when you make a choice about a pleasure, an amusement, a, a certain thing that you're going to engage yourself in, you must come to the decision of is it right? Is it true? Is it holy? Is it pure? A heart that's been purged is a heart that no longer has double-mindedness. It's a heart that's free from guiltiness. A heart that's free from filthiness. A heart that's free from selfishness. James 4.8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. The heart must be pure. It must be like the water that's not polluted by the poison. Even if it's just one small drop, it could be deadly. A heart that is pure is a heart that's totally, completely given over to God. God wants a clean heart. God always looks beyond the appearance and the stature of and he looks at the heart. You can see here in the verses that we read, and if you continued reading throughout uh, chapter 16, you would see about how Samuel brought the, uh, the young men before him and, and the ones that he thought were going to be king. But what did God say? I don't look on the outside. I'm not looking for um, the things that you might be looking for, but rather I'm looking at the heart. Secondly, this morning, the possession of a pure heart is essential. There can be no holiness without it. Sure, there are many who try to possess a, a pure heart. They may look the part. They may act the part. But First Peter, in chapter 1, it, it says a couple of things about that. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written... Be ye holy, for I am holy. What about, what does that word uh, conversation really mean? Well, your conduct, your behavior. How is your conduct? What is your behavior like? Sometimes I'm questioning my daughter's um, behavior. Last night was one of those moments. And uh, I'm not sure if she totally understood it or not, but I had to try to help her. Uh, understand that that behavior was not something that she should uh, be acting on. Tried to talk to her about it and tried to address it and say, hey, we, we've got a little problem here. Actually, it's a pretty big problem um, that you don't seem to recognize yet. But the truth is that I've probably seen some people that they seem to not understand the part about their conduct, their behavior, and being holy in all manner of conversation. We must have a pure heart in order to get to heaven. A pure heart is essential. 
a young lady who was attempting to, um, to defend her attendance at questionable places. She told her friends that she thought a Christian could go anywhere. And her friends replied, well, certainly, but um, what about the little instance last summer? And they told the story of how they went to a, um, a, a party that was at a, um, a coal, um, it was around a, a coal um, cave. And, and the, the one lady there, she said to the coal miner, she said, now, could I wear this white dress down into the coal mine? To which she said, well, yes, ma'am. There's nothing to keep you from wearing that white dress down there. But there's a considerable amount of dirt to keep you from wearing that white dress back. You see, there's nothing that really prevents a Christian from taking his good testimony wherever he goes. But there is much to keep him from bringing it back then we must be cautious. We must guard in all manner of conversation, in all manner of conduct. You see, the possession of a pure heart, it's essential to get to heaven. There's nothing that can, can take place without heart purity. There's no happiness without heart purity. God is looking for a heart that's meek and lowly, a heart that's teachable, a heart that's submissive, a heart that's pliable, a heart that's disciplined. A pure heart is essential to our lives. Thirdly, this morning, the enjoyment of a pure heart, it's immediately available. No one has a pure heart by either their nature or by culture, but everyone can have a pure heart by the grace of God. It's a provision of Christ's blood. And when he died on the cross and he shed his blood for you and for me so that we could have a pure heart. The leper said, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus answered him and said, be thou clean. What the leper needed for his body, we need for the soul. What Jesus is willing to do or was willing to do for the leper, he's willing to do for you today. It's something that can take place immediately. You know what an Etch-a-Sketch is? It's that little thing that uh, has a flat gray screen. It's kind of normally in a, in a red plastic frame. There's two white knobs on the front of the frame in the lower corners. And by twisting those knobs, you can begin to move the stylus. And it, it uh, uh, displaces aluminum powder on the back of the screen. And it leaves a solid line. How many of you have ever, you've ever done one of those? You've, you've etched a sketch. I'm sure some are better than others. I never was too good at etching a sketch. But one of my favorite things to do, um, it wasn't a good thing, but um, you know on the bottom of those etch-a-sketch, there's, there's um, this little white thing that you can slide. And do you know what happens when you slide that across? It immediately, I mean just in a moment, just whoop, everything's gone. Well, yeah. Uh, I had a sister, and um, she, she um, occasionally would etch a sketch. And uh, I'd always like to come up, and that's really nice. That is, that's a nice sketch. And then whoosh, take your hand and slide it across that slider, and immediately the sketch is gone. It wasn't good. But it, was, it reminded me that... God wants to do the same thing in our lives. He can wipe away the impurities and immediately make us pure. You might have a lifetime of, of doing things that are unwholesome, that are, are not holy, that may be wrong, that are sinful. But I want to tell you this morning, with one quick swipe of the master's hand, he can take a heart that's impure and make it pure. God wants to give you a pure heart. Only when we are pure will we be able to, to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you want to live a blessed life, you must have a pure heart. 
If you want the hope of seeing God in heaven, you must know that everything's right in your heart and that you possess a heart that is holy, a heart that's pure, a heart that has no sin. Jesus teaches the necessity of having a pure heart. The musicians are coming this morning. And my question for you today would be, do you possess, do you desire, do you have a pure heart? You see, God is looking for a heart that's pure. God's looking for a heart that is whole. Not just part of your being, but all of your heart. You you cannot be half in or half out. The impure, the immoral attributes will take over. They'll begin to dominate your heart to where it's no longer pure. God's looking for a heart that's clean. A heart that's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. A heart that's completely cleansed. A heart that's totally given over to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you this morning that the enjoyment of a pure heart can be completely and it is immediately available to you. The blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse you from all sin and it can make you pure Today We sang it as we closed um, congregational singing, but it was the song that I wanted to close with this morning, number 305 in your chorus book. It talks about that principle within. We already sang it once, but did you pay attention to the words? I want a principle within of jealous godly fear, a sensibility of sin, a pain to feel it near. Oh God, Make my heart to where if there's sin near, that it pains me. I want the first approach to feel a pride or fond desire, to catch the wandering of my will, to quench the kindling fire from thee that I no more may stray, no more thy goodness grieve. Grant me the fill of all I pray, the tender conscience give quick, As the apple of an eye, O God, my conscience make. Awake my soul when sin is nigh, and keep me still awake. Almighty God of truth and love, to me thy power impart. The burden from my soul remove, the hardness from my heart. O oh, may the least omission pain my reawaking soul and drive me to the blood again, which makes the wounded whole. If you're wounded this morning, if there's something in your life that it's just been tugging on you, and when you ask the question, do I have a pure heart? Do I have the kind of heart that God is looking for? What's your answer? I want to tell you this morning, You can come to the altar. You can come to the blood of Jesus Christ. He can make you whole. You can have that sensibility to sin and a heart that wants to be pure. Let's stand together, 305 in your course book. If you need to pray this morning, I'd invite you to step out. We'd love to pray with you. God wants to meet your need. Let's sing. Let's start with verse 1. I want a prince.
Heavenly Father, thank you for your help today. Thank you for your presence. Lord, help us to have the kind of heart that you're looking for. May it be a heart that is pure. Be with us as we go today, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your kind attention. May God bless you.